But other than that, I'll um, hand over to you, Adrian. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so one way, a bit unusual <laughs> for the lane for the lane four. So uh, expect me to sort of smile about this. Um, although one way to 40, 50 people is a bit different from the commentating I've been doing, which is, I think it's one way to about, I think we had 10 million to put Rebecca Adley into the 400 freestyle final, so that was quite interesting. And that's when she came third in, so I think tonight we're expecting about 12 and a half million, which is a bit weird, really, because, uh, but I, I do have somebody sat next to me when I'm commentating, so, and also you can't see me. Um, so yeah, looking forward to this, and I've been, you know, happy to do this. I'm, just in terms of where I am, um, I'm in the Team GB headquarters, so I'm, this is a sort of nerve centre in Stratford where the all the administration have moved here. So team, the Olympic Association have an office in central London, but they've moved to Stratford and taken the ninth floor of a building in Westfield just across from the park. Um, so I'm literally five minutes from the park and, and with all these sort of the people that are running the sports, just in a room next door to me um, are all the sports analysts, so all the people from different sports who the physiologists who are analysing performance data to feed back into the teams are sat next door as well. So there's a massive um, half the floor um, given over to them. Um, what else? Oh, it's also sort of friends and family place. This is where the athletes can meet their family. Um, so it's the sort of locked-in place where nobody else can go quite to, to relax because a lot of the family obviously don't have tickets for everything so can't get into the site. So this is off-site and it's a place for them to meet. So that's kind of what this is. Um, I'm in between um, my commentating duties, which is my holiday job from Lane 4. Um, and it's a nice holiday job. It's, it's, it's different hours, but it's still a bit tiring, actually. Um, we commentate for about two and a half hours in the morning and then prepare during the afternoon for an evening, 7.30 till sort of 9.30 commentary bit. So about four or five hours of commentating. And I do get bored of the sound of my own voice. Um, but we try and have a bit of fun and be, be informative as well. It's day seven today of eight days of swimming so the olympics have, i feel like it's just started but they're almost over for um for the swimming um pool swimmers the college team um so tomorrow night tonight is our penultimate finals tomorrow is our our last finals day um so yeah it's over saturday night we then have about well i have a four days break and then the open water swimming is on so on the 9th i think it's next thursday is, um carrie ann payne is going in the the 10 kilometer for women on the 9th around lunchtime and then on the 10th it's the men's they called dan fogg is going for great in that um so i'll be commentating that as well so i'm going to move over to the serpentine i've got a little shed apparently on the edge of the serpentine um to commentate on on the two open water races and they are two hours of swimming um one race 20 people six laps around the serpentine so we've kind of not worked out our strategy for that but we'll do that over the next few few days i'm sure um okay so what i thought i'd do in terms of construct of this was um i mean i'm happy to to you know do chat log questions if you want as we go along um i'll have to stick my glasses on to read them um, <laughs> um as we go through and i'll try and do those probably at the end but i've got three sections i was going to talk a bit of swimming chat and hopefully that's of interest to you well, it, i guess if you've logged on it might be of interest to you um so a bit about what i've noticed in the swimming pool um, and, and also sort of things that might be of relevance to to, to us in business, I guess. And then specifically into business, um, into what are some of the key stories from what's happened in this first week already. So I'm gonna pick out some stuff around cycling, rowing, as you might expect, the canoeing as well. So um, stuff like that. And then try and make the link in, in through, um, there's a lot of resilience stories. I mean, wow. I mean, that seems to be a feature actually of, of what I'm seeing is people's ability or not to cope with the pressure, the immediacy of what's going on, um, home advantage and all that sort of stuff, advantage, disadvantage. Um, so do a bit of that as well, and then we'll go for questions. Um, yeah, and I've, I've got quite plenty of time. I think we've got a schedule for now. It might not take that long, and we'll just see how it goes. And when you'll disappear, we'll, we'll stop, and I'll go have a drink and then commentate again. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, we are in sort of day seven. Um, I'm part, just to put it in, also, I'm in part of a BBC team that's got quite a few people in it, so I just do the commentating, but um, we're able to see quite a lot, so we're around the poolside a lot, and what I do, I'll just start with the British team, actually, and the emotions and the crowd, because a lot of them have talked about how um, how much they can hear the crowd, you've 18,000 people screaming for you, but I, I think, before I started this competition, I thought, oh, maybe... Yeah, about 80% of the team, it'll help raise their game, add a real advantage to them. 
um, and maybe 2015 won't be able to cope with it. I mean, this is just me doing my 80 20 thing. Um, and what I'm thinking is it's actually gone the other way, I'm almost. I mean, which is kind of disappointing in a way, but and surprising. But it seems like it's just been so overwhelming for people that they've um, they've not had the capability and the strategies to cope with it, which is kind of really kind of interesting because I know they've had a sports site working with them um, for a little bit, or some individuals have anyway. Um, but it's almost as if it's become too much. But there are certain individuals that have stood up um, and had successes, and I'm quite pleased to say it's the men's breaststroke is primarily as well as Rebecca Adlington. And so. In terms of personal best times, there have been um, only three people who have set personal bests. Um, and some of these times were set um, at the trials this year to qualify. So the three men's breaststrokers, a guy called Craig Benson, then Michael Jameson in the 200 metres, and, and Andrew Willis, um, have set best times. And Jameson, in particular, our silver medalist, got best time in the heat, final and, sorry, heat semi-final and final. So improved all three times. Um, which I think is quite interesting, actually. So, so what seems to have happened, and then that bit, Rebecca Adlington didn't do her best time, but um, got that bronze medal in the 400, and I think coped really well with the crowd. And she had expectation. You, I mean, can, not many people knew Michael Jameson, I don't think, before this. But Rebecca Adlington, they did know of. And and I think people, if people have been watching this, I mean, the expectation from the crowd or the... I mean, people thought she was maybe win the 400 and 800 again. She, she had two gold medals in Beijing. 400 freestyle and 800 freestyle, and the 400 she got the bronze in. But even in Beijing, she wasn't a, an odds on favourite for that. And it was kind of a sneaky gold, really. We didn't expect it. Um, where the 800 was more her race. So the 400, on she, I think she was like fourth or fifth going into this in terms of time. So her third was fantastic from the outside lane. And I know she's really confident right now. Um, so we might as well pick up on that, um, on the other because it's her final tonight. So I'm quite excited about that, looking forward to it. There are only two people. There are, there are eight people in the swimming pool, but there are two people in the race, really. And there's a Danish girl who um, won the 1500 metres in the World Championships last year. So it's going to be a head to head kind of, kind of race. So it's almost like um, two boxers slugging it out, actually, because they'll be next to each other. They're the fastest. It's nearly an eight minute race. 7.51, I think the is Eight minutes. No, eight minutes 21. Sorry. I need to know these things. Um, eight minutes 21. And they're separated by 11 one hundredth of a second. And that's after the heats, so very tight. They're both world class. Um, but I bumped into, as you do with these sorts of things, I bumped into Becky's coach in Pret a Manger, <laughs> um, and we had 20 minutes just talking about how she was getting on the preparation. And he seemed quite confident, actually, um, which is good to see. Bill Finesse, he's done a great job. He was coaching when I was swimming, so he's got great wisdom and experience. And I think that's helped her a lot. And he's taken us through age group swimming into being an adult and growing up as well because she didn't have a good year in 2009 after she won in Beijing really suffered I think from the success I mean it's almost like a what do I do now you know won two gold medals um, and the year after was a real sort of let down so came off the you know the, the performance slipped didn't try and improve anything it was just simply that she was overwhelmed by what happened and then started to build up again every year has got better and last year got a, a gold and a silver in the world championship so she's the world champion walking into tonight's race and the girl she beat was Lottie Freese and she beat her on the last length of a 16 length race so we're imagining it's going to go the same way and a lot of what will happen I mean there are two things going to play here one is she's going to stick to a race plan and she'll have a plan and as far as what I was hearing from Bill would be that she has to get out and try and go very very quickly and, and, and almost like not let Lester Freeze get ahead so actually push the pace of the race all the way uh, from the beginning because she's the strongest on the last length and she'll probably out sprint Freeze at the last length so, and I think Freeze's tactic will be the opposite. So that's the one thing you, she's got in mind. So there's a plan for performance, but there's also the flexibility because the one thing, you know, if I know that she's going to do that, Lottie Freeze, you can know she's going to do that. So I imagine she's going to go out like the Clappers as well. So it could be interesting. So that's going to be quite exciting. Um, yeah, we might, a guy called Mike Perrybrun is her physiologist, and I saw him last night as well. And they were talking about the different sets that she's been doing, and she's been swimming on some of the sessions she's been doing at least two seconds faster on some of the sessions she's been doing. So so she's in good shape and I'm happy to take questions about what I think, what else I think, but I mean, that's, I've yeah, talked to the coach and physiologist, so I'm quite close in there, but, um, and I've observed it. So I think we're all right, but don't bet your house on it. Um, okay. So <laughs> what else? I mean, the, so you can't, can't talk about swimming without talking about uh, Michael Phelps. So, um, I, it's interesting. I thought he'd gone a, a, a Olympics too far. I even said that I think in my commentary and got 
short shrift from some of the people <laughs> giving me feedback saying, really? No, we just didn't. And he just won that um, fantastic race last night, the medley against Ryan Lochte. And so what seems to be happening here is that, um, well, first of all, the form book is just out the window. So he wasn't ranked fastest in the world in that race. He was, I think he was quite low down. But you've got somebody who was able to, yeah, manage the pressure, was able to stay focused. And I know, I know particularly he talked a lot about I mean, Bowman, his coach, did a long analysis yesterday about what Mike, makes Michael Phelps special. And he said this majority is mental. He said pretty much it's his ability to take one race at a time. It's his ability to have a plan, be, be flexible with it. It's his ability to block out everything else that goes on around him. So that's quite impressive. Um, so, yeah, right, Michael Phelps, not to, I don't know what else to say about him. Other I mean, I'm happy to take questions about his resilience and what he's like as a person um, as we go through it. But that's that's in the, I think it's around the pressure. I mean, his belief is unquestionable, but he, he believes that he's got the ability to do it. The other thing that stood out in the pool, obviously, if people have been following it, is um, there quite a lot of young um, female swimmers coming through. So the 15-year-old won the 100 metres breaststroke, um, Lithuania, who trains in Britain, which is, kind of like the idea of adopting her but she doesn't want to be British she's very proud of Lithuanian roots um, and a 16 year old Chinese girl um, both made big improvements in times and they're, they're not the only ones now I can name probably three or four I, I would try and name three or four Japanese swimmers um, but I'm not so good on, on punctuation on, on um, pronunciation um, and th you see it's quite interesting it's this idea of making big drops in time or performance when you're not hampered with um not necessarily expectation, but you're not hampered with what you should do. <laughs> um, oh, so why can't I do three-second personal best? Why shouldn't I be able to do this? And it's quite interesting, that sort of freedom of thinking without the sort of the stuff you impose on yourself. So that's been quite noticeable. They're almost like the naivety and the you know, the openness. Is, and I don't know how to create that. It's quite interesting to work out how you might create that at work. Um, and then the men's breaststroke um, is quite interesting as well. Um, the British men, because I mean they they did fantastically well. And if you've seen, then again, if people have seen the interview with Michael Jameson and Ryan Lochte, the American guy who's got a couple of goals as well, they're very similar. They're very matter of fact. This is not everything in my life. It's great to be here. I'm enjoying it, but I'm going to perform as well. I think that's quite interesting about both of them. But they're not. It's not. It doesn't seem like it seems like the emotion isn't out there. They use it. It's like yeah, now I'm in the Olympics. This is important to me. I work very hard for it, but it's just a swimming race sort of thing. And, they, and they, they're able to do that. They're able to think about putting their performance in context, really, and kind of rationalising it to such a degree that you know, if people know the lane four sort of stress management model around not catastrophizing, not over blowing something up and generalising. Because you know, I've said this to a few people before, and I know some of you on, online online of um, Heard me talk about it. You know, at the end of the day, no, you're only racing seven people, um, and that's all you've got to beat. So it's just how do you put it all into context and not over get overwhelmed by it? So there's some sort of swimming stuff. Let me. I'm you know, just wanna, if I can move along my slides or not. Oh, there we go. Oh, the swimming. That's, that's the. I was going to talk about swimming over that swimming pool slide, but um, that's a, a shot down the lane, down lane four, in the pool. That's um, with Rebecca Adams. In fact, she will stand on that block. In what time is it? Four. Yeah, she'll be on that block in three and a half hours, looking down at length, looking at 16 lengths. I think Lottish Reese is to the right of her, so um, that's what they'll be. That's what she'll be seeing. Um, interesting. So just as a complete aside and completely random, somebody asked me this morning if why did he lose count? Was it 16 lengths? But they have a bell at the, with two lengths to go, and they also have numbers. So somebody counts them, so they put a little board with numbers at the other end. So that's what happens there. Okay, look, so you just thought I'd pick up some more um, sort of stories. So I've done through Adlington a little bit. Um, so the, 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 some great successes here, and you've got very, very different stories, I think, to pull out of some of these. Um, I'll probably go in chronological order, actually, um, with the, I think it was the rowing girls first, Helen Glover and um, Heather Stanning down the bottom. And what was interesting there, again, I'm not sure if anybody's seen the interviews, or have been watching this stuff, Obviously, got to got to work, and that I think that was during the day. Um, but Steve Redgrave was interviewed about these these two, and there's a couple of things that come out of rowing. And the first one is that Steve actually talked about leadership. Um, it was one of the first things he said. I mean, it, apart from away from the emotion, when people asked him about rowing, why are we so successful? 
and he talked about leadership. He talked about um, having, this is an interesting one for soccer, um, or business when you turn around chief executive or managing directors. He has said that we're at the same place in people in place for over 12, 15 years. You know, people who, and these people are steeped in the knowledge. They understand the industry, understand the, the sport of rowing. So they've had a guy called um, David Tanner as a performance director. So I don't know if you know in sports, so there is, let's say, work it out. So there's the equivalent of a managing director, the performance director, and um, the chief exec, and have somebody who is the head coach. Um, so the chief exec is David Tanner. He runs the business of rowing. And then you have Paul Thompson, who's the women's coach, and Jürgen Groper, who's the men's coach. So those two coaches, and both of those have been in place over 12 years. And so it's a very tight leadership team. Um, and the vision and, you know, the, the performance goals are very strong. So the vision of rowing is to be the greatest rowing nation. And then the performance goals around the different boats, and they cause tensions because, you know, Grobler particularly is notorious for no, um, shuffling his boats around to get the best crew in a particular boat for a gold medal. So he'll, you know, he broke up what was the second best pair in the world to stick them in the four because he thought they weren't going to beat the New Zealand pair. They thought they would win the gold in the four. And so he's, you know, the, there are performance objectives within rowing and they're quite ruthless with their objectives and they shuffle their resources around accordingly. But I think that there's an element of strong support and challenge and, and Greg would be a great person. Greg still would be a great person to talk about this and and I imagine he's going to come back to work shortly. I was chatting to him yesterday, actually. I say shortly, I have a little bit of a break. Um, he was he was actually, I think on reflection, quite pleased with what they achieved. I think I think he realised, and if you saw the race, realised that it could have been fourth. Um, they put it all on the line and, and risked everything for the gold and, 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 and basically losing the silver. Um, but I thought it was a very brave thing. But the, the way they, the teams in rowing come together for each other is absolutely phenomenal. And we've just seen, seen one today. I don't know if people saw it at lunchtime, but we won the, um, the skulls, double skulls women as well. So first time women have won a gold medal in rowing, and we've got two in two days. Um, so, yes, the, the, sort of the, the element of support and challenge is very strong. And rowing, it, yeah, highlighted specifically leadership. Cycling um, in, in those the next order was the men's sprint. Um, now, that, that's got a, a great story of leadership as well, actually, if you took the Dave Brailsford story, the performance director who, well, drove, got those guys to Beijing to create the success they had in Beijing. Um, but then in Beijing said, well, I'm going to take five years, we're going to put a team together and win the Tour de France. And it took him four. Um, and he's all come back two weeks later and put this team together. Well, not put this team together, it's been going for a while, but had the vision to just jump back in and say, right, okay, so what we're going to do at the Olympics. But this particular three, the sprint, the men's mm-hmm. sprint, um, uh, you've got J- Jason Kenny on the left, you've got, um, I can't remember his first name, Hines in the middle, and, and Chris Hoy. I mean, that, whatever his name is, Hines, he's only at 19, I think. Um, but the three of them, I mean, if you look at team, it's a very um, different kind of sport in terms of a team because, again, for people who didn't see it, these guys have got to do three laps round the velodrome and they've got to do it together. The first, and then they peel off. The first person, the first person does the first lap, and the job of the per- first person is to get a fantastic start and get off to the fastest start and take the other two in the wheel slipstream behind him. The next one's got to build on that and be very, very quick. So almost like the fastest pace goes there. The third person, and then he peels off. So the third person is the only one that does all three laps, which was Chris Hoy, and his experience and if you like strength to to be able to do that and keep sprinting, um, taking the team over the line. So. The, the thing about this is around different skills and different roles, but being very clear, being very clear about who you're selecting for what job. And the reason the, the guy that led off, 19, Hines, is 19, they struggled after retirement. I think it was J- Staff, Jamie Staff, I think his name was. They, there is, they struggled when he retired to find someone to fill that position. And they had tried two or three different people in it. Um, and this guy was selected, not because he was the best sprinter, but because he was the very best off the start. And for the first 17 seconds, he was the guy that was going to do it. And he's only 19 years of age. And there's some very good comments by Chris Hoy because I think he, they, he disqualified the team I think last year at the World Championships and or, or maybe it was early this year and uh, Chris Hoy said no we back him you know because he did he, a technical error and maybe I think it was quite similar to the Jess Furnish um, Victoria Pendle one to the one yesterday but Chris backed him publicly solidly and said this is the guy for our team and he will he has the talent to do what we need him to do um, and again if you saw this in the early uh, rounds. Heinz's bike broke or he fell off within 20 metres of start and had to refocus himself. So, I mean, that was a very tight team. There's a team story there, but there's also a refocusing story around how 
you know, he would have been able to five, ten minutes later get back on the bike and take the team back through the um, the next round. So, um, so, I, so I'm going to talk about cycling in a second, a bit more about on a talent agenda. Um, bottom right, I thought was a nice team story with the with the canoeing guys. Um, and Laneford's got a particular pride pride around the canoeing because um, Katie Warren, or some of you online, I don't know if you ever worked with Katie, but Katie was one of my trainers and consult then consultants, and then left to become their sports psychologist. Um, and I, I've also spoken to Katie in the last couple of days, who's, I, well, she was jumping up and down when I was speaking to her, it was quite soon after. Um, but immensely proud of what they've achieved. But I, I, I don't know if people saw the interview, it pretty much immediately after they came off the water, she got a situation, I can't, I can't, which order they're in, I think the gold medalist on the left, the silver on the right, or the way around. Um, yeah, the way around, I think. Um, but the, the, it, pres- it was very interesting because the, the, the good two that got the gold had gone down with a really fast time. And then the guys that eventually got the silver, David Florence, I think, was one of the guys leading it. They had to wait um, and deliver a time that could try. They knew that it was going to be a British gold. One of them was going to get it. The guys that already um, canoed or paddled down, or they, they who were going to start off the, off the start. The pressure on that for me must, was, must be immense because I think as an individual, you've got the chance of getting a gold medal. Um, but you, know, and you, but you know your teammates will get the gold medal. One of you is going to get a medal. So there's something quite significant happened. And when they got in off the water and they got the silver and they interviewed, they all wanted to be in the interview together. Like they, they, they tried to push the silver medalist off, the B, typical BBC, um, to get the gold medalist in. And the gold medalist said, no, stay here. And they'd put their arms around each other. And I thought there's a, a nice thing going on there, not just about coping with pressure, but the fact that they genuinely were all happy that Great Britain had got the silver and bronze. And that was almost the first thing that came out of their mouth was this whole team, our team has done something historical that we've never ever done before. And I, I do think it was a testament to what they've done together. Um, can I feel I'm like rattling on a bit? I've got a couple more bits. Um, I mean, again, this the testament to quite a lot of this, I, su- I suggest, is around the support team. And you hear now quite a lot about the, the psychologist you would do if you connected to people, the nutritionist, the physiologist, the physiotherapist, and strength coach, conditioning, all these people that sit around these athletes um, is quite critical, really. And I think I often talk when I'm talking to businesses about, you know, for me as a leader of Lane 4 now, I'm, I'm quite open-minded to bringing experts in. So I won't wait for the bank manager to phone us. I'll get him in and say, what do you know and how can you help Lane 4 and the accountant and the lawyer and try and bring these guys in to, um, to bring the best of what they know so that I can get that for my performance. Um, so I think that's quite a, 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 it's almost like a learning that you have as as athletes. You learn to draw on the best of the best, and you're open-minded enough to get their expertise. And I think it's often interesting when, if you're in a support function in an organisation, or if you're in the line, how you draw on the support function and how that's viewed. Because in, at this level, it's it's a very symbiotic thing, it's, and it's also very intense, intensive, and people have very open discussions about what they can add, what they can't add, and how they can add. And the agenda is not held by one group. I mean, it's always interesting for HR people, actually. But you know, you, it's not the agenda isn't even held by the performer. It's held by all together. Um, and you're doing something for the benefit of the total performance. So, what is if we're in business and we're supporting? You know, what is what we can do? What can we deliver? How does it add value to the performance? But actually, are we all bought into the same goal, which is the performance goal? Actually, at the end of the day, it's not specifically a unit goal. So the nutritionists don't have a specific goal, and if they do that, that's fantastic. They all want their guys to get the medals, um, so which make, makes me always think about performance is is an output, but it's like a stack of inputs. And so, what sports taught me in, to apply to business is in the round, really, what performance is. You know, performance is uh, there is lots of outputs around performance, and particularly very visible. Particularly if you look at this slide, there's a performance output which is about meddling at the Olympics. Um, but the inputs to that are just phenomenal. They're massive. They're, they're very varied. And often when you talk in business to people about performance inputs, they just talk about the single thing that's the same as the output rather than the 20 things, that areas that could be of value and how they link those supports together. So that was, I think, quite curious as well. Um, I just want to finish off on the talent piece. Cause I think talent's quite interesting. I just want to share a, a lane for a particular view on this around, um, well, the... the a bit, a bit, if, we, if you look at the middle, I'll draw your attention to the middle. So the ability, resilience, and learning mindset in terms of assessing talent with that kind of, um, if you like, those kind of pieces, the potential for those pieces. Then that those people then meet opportunity. 
which is the fourth part of it really, and then giving people the opportunity to perform, and then again, this whole thing about ready now, ready later. Um, whether you know whether you need to give them time, whether you can stick them in place now, whether it's for the individual, whether it's for the company, the organisation. So, um, just on this one, um, cycling and rowing are brilliant at this. So I'll give you the example of rowing, and it, it is very relevant to the two ladies in the middle. So cycling do a well, sorry, rowing have done a sporting giants program. You probably you might have known about that if you've been listening to the interviews. But five years ago, so Steve Redgrave launched it, and it was a it was a program of um, talent identification where they selected people with certain criteria that were they believed would be um, make good rowers. Now they started off with a a five eleven, five foot eleven. It was a height thing. Five foot eleven and six foot three. Five foot eleven for women, six foot three for men. But then the ability was measured in all sorts. That was a sort of benchmark, if you like. Okay, that's the sort of starting point. But then everything else was, was assessed in very different ways. So there was definitely physiological ones. But then they also, in, in that program, by the way, they took 7,000 people five years ago and they took put them into, it, was, it wasn't just rowing, it was rowing, I think it was volleyball, handball, basketball, a few other sports as well. And they took 7,000 people they created a smaller base of 100 people, and then I think something like 49 of those people have made international. And those, uh, Helen Glover was one of the girls that got gold yesterday from that program. So four, you might have heard the story four or five years ago, she didn't even row. Um, so the Talent ID program is quite interesting, but what both cycling and rowing are brilliant at is not just assessing talent on the physical attributes. So, and, and cycling is stated, you can look at cycling's Talent ID program and development plans, and personal resilience and people, their ability to manage um, the situation and pressure. Okay, they can, you can develop it, but they actually assess it in the first place. So they're getting the right people with some capability to do that. Um, and when you think about, I'm sorry, I don't know his name, I can't remember his name, Heinz, maybe Philip, making up. Heinz first, um, his, when he fell off his bike, five minutes later, the guy's back on a bike and he qualifies a team to the next round, and 19 in the Olympic final, in his home crowd. Um, by the way, this is something I think that British Swimming hasn't got right yet. <laughs> so I think British Swimming needs to do a bit more on this. Uh, and then learning mindset, you know, it's the rock or sponge, it's um, Dweck's, Carol Dweck's, um, you know, are you open-minded, are you, are you looking for growth, is it growth or a fixed mindset? And they are assessing this at a talent ID level, so it's not enough just to have the, the attributes or the capabilities, if you like, in the technical aspect of what your job is. And then they're very good at giving opportunity, and you might have heard um, the guy that won the shooting, the trap shooting last night, last night I saw his interview, and he talked about um, he talked about exactly about this about the, the open mindedness and the, but having the opportunity to um, to shoot and to, to to do what he needed to do. I thought he was he was fantastic when he talked about that. Um, so um, that's the kind of view of of, of, of talent management. Um, I, again, I think I've gone on, on off on one. I'm just happy to open up for questions now if people have got them. I'm just sticking my glasses on so I can read them. So I hope that was half interesting for now. And let's see where we go. Oh, Philip Hines, I think his name was. Yeah, I've just got a little, a little nudge. So, um, yeah, could I, I, if anybody's got any questions, would you, could you type them in? That'd be quite good if you could do that. I see one um, hasn't come in on the types yet, so hold on a second. So, David, have you got... I can't see um, the question. I don't know if you can type it in, David. I'm not sure about Isaac, if you can manage this at all. I've got... Like one question and one hand up, but they're not coming through on chat to me. Yeah, there's no audio, everyone. So yeah, it'll have to be for the chat box. Okay, thanks. Okay, I've got one so far. So, is there anything Team GB can learn from the Americans? Well, <laughs> Americans so far, it's quite interesting because I mean, if we talk about swimming. Um, because they've not shown in, I'm just thinking about all the other sports. If here's a swimming related question, then it's quite interesting. America and Australia were head to head pretty much um, in swimming for quite a while. And Australia really underperformed in this competition. Um, but I, I, I think it's a system thing. I think the Americans have got a, a talent development system that's nailed on. The talent development system is a journey through. And I was just talking to a couple of people here in the Olympic headquarters about the talent journey. So basically, the Americans have got the learn to swim program connected to the swimming club program connected to the high school program connected to the university program connected to the olympic squad program so the talent identification at every level is very very strong and the development plans are just so well known britain's quite good but there's the links between school and club are not very good at all so um, that needs to be worked on um 
I think the other thing about learning from Americans on that, there's a stack of questions coming in. Um, thank you. Um, is, there, is there their ability to handle the pressure? And I think that you just need to look at any of the interviews with Michael Phelps or Ryan Lochte or any of those guys and to see how they're coping with what they are coping with. I think they put themselves in situations, a lot of scenario planning. I think they do a lot of um, managing what they can control. They do a lot of controlling the controllers. And they put themselves in the scenario thing. They actually do it physically, not just mentally. They actually do it. It's almost like the penalty taking practice. They do it and, and make it scary. So they'll, they'll put themselves into real situations. Okay, so let's have a go. So David, thank you. David Thomas, um, how are you? Um, question, China seems to be successful across a broad range of sports at the Olympics. Great Britain has also won medals at nine different sports so far, but what do you think Britain can learn from their approach? Um, I think the Chinese approach um, is quite a bit known, actually. Un unfortunately, the press are determined not to report to the written press about what is known. They quite like the, just the scare stories or the stories that the Chinese are doing bad things, but they're not. They've got, because we've got um, there's an American coach coaching over there. There's a British coach that I know, swimming coach. There's also swimming coaches over there. There's an Australian coach over there. So, and Sun Yang, the 1500 guy, he's being coached in, in, on the Gold Coast. So there's a, it's a lot well known. But what they, I think they do, what I talked about the Sporting Giants program, they do the assessment of talent very well. I'm not sure if we're assessing talent in as ruthless as a way as they do. Um, I'm not sure how much free choice there is. I think there's a bit less free choice. But, you know, I, I don't think as much as we like to scare ourselves with. I think that the, there's some very happy Chinese people on the blocks when the podium, when they win medals, um, and they work very hard. Um, so I, I think it's a systems approach. I think they've got a great systems approach. And we're, Great Britain is, in, if you're talking about my own sport, swimming, we're only six years into a system program. A guy called Bill Sweetham came in and shook the sport up and by the scruff of the neck, changed leader, turned it around, but it was not liked in the end because he upset too many people. But the, the result of what you're seeing today, the success around the last three or four years is his. He, doesn't, he didn't survive it. But the guy that's taking it on, Michael Scott, has done a great job. But we're, we're so not we're not long into the system yet. That's the issue we've got. Okay. Um, um, okay. Thanks, Dan Haywood. Um, and also, Team GB Olympians are competing, even though there was no expectation of meddling. I can see the plus side of this regarding the promotion of that sport. But how do you keep those guys motivated and continuously striving to do their best? That's interesting, actually, there's sort of no expectation of meddling and being realistic about the targets. There's no point in giving somebody a gold medal target if, realistically, they're not going to get a gold medal. Um, I, I think it's about that. I think it's simply about working out what an ambitious yet stretching target would be. And I know I, met, I talked to the handball performance director, um, and I'm not sure if you were at the session, Dan, when we had her there. Um, but it's this thing about building a sport from the ground up, and then when you get to the players you actually work on the short, medium and long-term targets with them and, and give them something that's excitable, stretching, but that they buy into, that's realistic, I think. Um, and I think, yeah, for an athlete, their main goal of being here will not be to promote their sport. You know, if you're in a minor sport, a water polo player playing these Olympics isn't going to be thinking when they get in the pool, oh, I'm doing this game so I can promote my sport to the rest of Britain because they've got a, time, a lifetime, a lifetime span in their sport they are at the top of their game for their country, and that's why they're here. And so it's an opportunity. So I think what the, the goal there is to get the team to buy into something, have a conversation and buy into something that's meaningful. And it might be to win two games out of eight. It might be to assess who's on the same level and, 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 and beat that. Or it might, and then, then it will be around perform process goals. It will all be around specific a defense routine or an attack routine, and can we improve those? And, you know, this idea, it, you know, small wins lead to great greater confidence um okay hi sarah right um how much do the athletes focus on team versus individual performance if they are doing individual competition um this is a great question particularly i'm sat in team gb headquarters um it's not a marketing logo team gb it's uh it is a an entity and it, it does work um the code of conduct is very strong it was I mean, I don't know if you've heard Clive Woodward talk about the teamship rules that he created in the rugby, but he's done exactly the same here for Team GB. All the leaders of all the sports, 26 different sports, um, over, this is a period over six months, basically talked about what were the values for this, this whole team, if everyone was going to work together, what could they all buy into? Um, and they debated it, chewed it around, had, you know, big uh, facilitative sessions. 
they all went to their sports, talked to their coaches and athletes, and between a series of iterations, backward forward, backward forward, backward forward, they came up with um, five particular values. Um, and then it's gone back out to all the athletes that made the team to sign up to the code. Um, so there is something at a big level that's caught sort of embracing everybody. Um, but then when you get into individual sports, if you think about swimming, you, swimmers see more of their teammates and their parents. Or, you know, you're in the, you're, a lot of sports people are in the practice area um, for hours and hours and hours with other people. So, you know, I swam, um, let's say, on the, well, even on my Leeds team. So I'm, I'm in a squad with 26 people, 13, so let's say half and half men, women. So half of the, the team I don't compete directly against. Um, so I want them to win everything that they race. Um, I'm going to support them. I'm going to help them. Um, and then the other guys, freestyle, back, fly, I didn't do any of that. So there's only two people I was competitive with. So, And even then, what I learned what I learned was to, when we pushed each other and we shared stuff and we tested stuff together, we all went up and up and up. Um, and when I, when I think I broke the world record, one of the years I broke the world record, my teammate at Lee's was third in the world. He was second to me and just missed the world record, actually. Um, so, And all our games were, were, were taken up to another notch. And I think that's what they do really well in rowing. Again, Greg would be great to talk about this. Because in rowing terms, they do that. You know, you pick a larger squad. They all have a philosophy and a value set and a culture of sharing, working hard, pushing each other, but in a, in a, uh, what is it, um, a healthy, competitive way so that they know if they get in a boat, if they are selected, they're more likely to get the gold medal. Whereas if they work against each other, and they get in the boat, well, they might come fourth or fifth. So there's something about that. All the athletes here have signed a code that they won't start partying or drinking and will go and support every other team member till the end of the games. So that's what they're doing. So they're all in until the end. And you'll see different sports people. You'll see the swimmers at different sports if, if they pan to the crowd because that's, that's what they'll be doing in track suits. Okay. Um, let me have a look. Um, Ruth Atkin, when the swimmers come out in track suits and jackets, have they been warming up? And if so, how do they warm up? Yeah, they, there is a 50-metre pool underneath the main 50-metre pool. So, so the one you see on TV, then you go down some stairs and there's a replica underneath. It's, a, it's an amazing facility. And so what they do is they warm up in the pool. So if they're a late event, they might go well, it's 7.30 tonight. They'll probably go at 6 o'clock, 6.15 and do it. The pool is open before it closes down for the first race. And so everyone goes in the main pool, but then any more extended warm ups or any warm up nearer the race will be done downstairs. And that's where they all are. And then they come upstairs for the race. And they'll do flexibility as well, not just swimming kind of training. Hello, Watson. 50% um, of the Olympians from public school. <laughs> What's your view on this? Sporting giants aside, how do you get this figure up? I presume you don't mean more people from public from private school. Um, so we want more people from the from public schools. Um, I think it refers to what I was talking about, about talent, idea, development, idea and development. I think, again, a systems issue, an organisation issue. Uh, there's the English, the English Institute of Sport, English, UK Sport, lottery money, and each individual sport, some sports are English, like hockey, and then have a GB team, um, and some sports are British. So that, that whole stack of us coming together and pulling each other apart as countries, which gives it in play. Um, I know the Minister of Sport is quite keen and the head of the Olympic Association are very keen to break it all down, stick them all together. There's lots of sort of um, positioning and politicking, as you might expect. Uh, what it needs to do is get everybody together and say, OK, here is a, like China, here is a talent route. And it's got school, so it's got club and learn to swim, like if it's my own sport, into school, whatever school it is, and create the networks and the, the feelers out that bring people into clubs and squads. Um, because then what you'll do is give opportunity. And I, I, mean, I don't know if we've got time here. A little, little side. When I was, so, when I was um, 12 in, in Bradford, Bradford's quite a poor, well, it's, it's still not the um, richest town in the world. Um, it's quite a poor town. Um, and there were not many swimming pools. And we knew, I was 12, and this guy, he, he's the most visionary guy I've ever known, David Firth. He, um, he knew that there were about four swimming pools in Bradford, or five, that might give him one or two days of training. No more. So you couldn't get 10 sessions out of them, but you could get one or two. So you basically got them all to give one or two sessions free around the city. And for two, three of them were public. One was a private school. And public as in um, comprehensive. 
Uh, one was a private school and one was the uh, council-owned pool. And basically he took kids from the Bradford School Championships, all the good kids, no matter what school they're at, and he put us all in a squad, all the best swimmers in a squad. And we basically went to different venues every single day. It was a different venue around the city. Um, so we got our 10 sessions in. This is in the 70s. So when people tell me, there's no, you can't get pool space, you can. Um, you just need somebody to go about it. But then what, what I did notice then was, in fact, I was the only one um, from private school, actually, in the squad in the end. Um, and the rest were all public. And four of them went on to represent Great Britain. Okay, um, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Um, Kit Mills. What does potential look like for me in the business world? What are the key things you'd look for? I think it relates to this last slide in a way, but potential for me, I, I've got a particular view of potential in everybody and talent is everybody. Um, I think I've gone away over the years. I mean, I've been 17 years in HR now, and L&D, longer than I was a swimmer. Um, I think I've gone away from the view that you should identify and nurture your high potentials more than others. Um, because, because it's interesting. I think you need to select. I think you do need to select, but I'm more interested in selecting people on a rounded view of how they can you know, manage be resilient, how they got the learning mindset is massive actually. And I, I I didn't really view it in this way when I was in sport because I didn't know much about the world I'm in now when I was twenty, twenty two. But I saw kids make it through the lead system who you would look at and they were pretty, their strokes were pretty ropey. You know, they didn't look great in the water and they were they, they worked really hard on what was a limited, I think, swimming ability. But their attitude and their aptitude to learn and the resilience and the ability to stand up and be counted got some of the kids from maybe like a county where somebody might have written them off and said, well, you're probably only going to make it here. And our coach let, our coach had them in the international squad because of the, the two things you see on the screen, the right and left hand side. He had, that's why he had them in the squad. Not because he said, well, actually, you've got a great stroke. He was, he was brilliant in Leeds, Terry Dennison. Um, and so, yeah, they, they overperformed their swimming talent. I'm not sure if that's a, a comp comprehensive answer. We've not got too long. I'm trying to pick some more questions. We've got quite a few. Um, before I take, take some, some fun questions in here, I'll see if I can um, um, answer some of the other ones. Um, um, what's been my, okay, we'll go for this one because we're getting towards the end. What's been my most embarrassing moment in the commentary box? Um, Stephen Ching. Anything to do with the Russian swimmer last Saturday? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not everybody will have heard that one. I thought I was I was trying to say he was he was uh, he put everything into the first half of the race, and I said a very embarrassing sentence. Um, <laughs> and my producer put his head on the table next to me, and my co-commentator raised his eyebrows and turned his microphone off, and started giggling. Um, that isn't my most embarrassing. Well, yeah, my most embarrassing moment actually was when we had to redo the commentary for Eric Neal. And again, not a lot of people know this, but we actually couldn't commentate on the Eric the Eel thing when he did his first. That was it. What was that? Was that Athens or I can't remember Sydney? And we had to redo it. Actually, so the commentary here, whenever they re replay Eric the Eel, is a redo because we couldn't cope as we did it live. Um, okay, we've just. What have we got here? What is the key enabler? So I'm moving around a bit. Sorry, I'm just flicking the last slide up because we are going to do some stuff for for people. Um, post games, so sort of lessons from. So we'll be obviously sharpening up what I've been observing. We've got a number of people around Lane Four connected, sports psychologists, Dom's team manager, Dominic Minor, team manager of Modern Pentathlon. I haven't started yet. And we've got a good relationship with Clive Woodward, who's performance director here, who will be reviewing the performance of all the sports formally. And so we're bringing that information back to bear, into bear, and so offering that out to business, to clients. Um, so what is the, yeah, this is from Ramesh. Uh, what do you think is the key enablers required to continue to improve in any sport? I, what will athletes take from this Olympics to the next? Key enabler to improve in any sport? I, I, I think it's the same in business. I, 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 I cannot overestimate. I mean, there's been so much work on it, as I say from Carol Dweck, around the fixed and um, open mindset, rock or a sponge. You know, how to what, even when you, so if you're an Olympic champion, can you continuously learn? You know, do you keep on thinking about how do I get better? If you're Michael Phelps, do you think about what's the different challenge? And that, he, he's brilliant at that. And where do I where do I learn something new from? Where do I get the difference? Where do I get something to improve on? I think you've got to for, think forward that 
any numbers that you have are going to change. So the performance numbers, whether it be, I don't know, profitability, utilization, operational numbers in business or in sport, the numbers you measure against, they're all going to change. They're always going to move. Um, and they're going to have to be better. So you've got to improve. So what you what people look at then are different and new ways. So that innovation is quite strong. It's a very innovative culture in Team GB, actually. And I've, I have noticed that that's the thing that creates a team, is they innovate together. So you, you rather than innovating in swimming and rowing separately, when you're both trying to move something through water, why don't you innovate together? So in the winter, a lot of sports science, I mean, they're all out here, the best of the country, sports scientists are just next door. Um, that's the, at the moment, they're analysing performance now, as it matters, can they change it in a day or two days? But when it comes to October, November, December, they'll be doing all the innovation, which will be around, well, particularly swimming and rowing fluid dynamics. You'll be doing some stuff in cycling, swimming, and a number of other sports around material and fabric. So innovation usually drives people together, and they'll be looking at small margins, incremental margins in every single piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Okay, um, let's have a look. Let's just scan through, sorry. Um, hmm. I think that's it. Has, I can't, has anybody... Have I not got a question that somebody's asked that I haven't answered? Um, why, do the, why are the Australians underperforming? Um, I don't know about that. They, yeah, the swimmers are underperforming. Um, they're not coping with pressure as well. One of the, I mean, they're bigger Australian. They're sort of hundred meter freestyle. A guy called James Magnuson folded here, which is quite interesting. Um, so the noise isn't, and the pressure isn't just affecting British people; it's affecting everybody. I just think it's because of the expectation. I think, I think Magnuson, you took Magnuson and who underperformed and Phelps they performed. Magnuson was talking all year about winning the Olympics, being the Olympic champion, I'm the best in the world. Phelps all year has been talking about doing all these pro the process things. He talks about mastery, this, doing this well, doing that well. So Phelps has never talked about um, winning medals. He never does. Even in the press conference, people are trying to ask him, you know, you're going to break the whatever it was, the most medals. Oh, just sorry to use a verb called medals. Um, getting the most medals of any Olympian, and um, he said, "Don't ask me that question. I don't think about it. I don't. It's not in my head." <laughs> um, he said, I, "I truly am thinking about a race at time." That's very. If, you, if actually, if you, it is believable when you see what he's achieved through this week, when he had a bit of a you know nightmare on day one when he lost that 400 medal, he didn't even make a medal. And all of a sudden, he comes back and he has the race of his life last night. And he's got 100 fly tonight, by the way, which is the race before Addington's. So don't just tune in at 7:45. Make sure you're there at 7:38, because Phelps is doing under fly, and I think he's going to win that. So Phelps could come away from this with four gold medals, not because he started off thinking he wanted to win all the Olympic gold medals. He he started off thinking I'm going to do race one, and then recover because he wasn't thinking about race two until race two, sort of thing. Okay, I think we're running down, aren't we? We're running out of time now. Um, Oh, here was one. So, thanks, Sarah. Do I wish I was back in the pool? It's really hot in this room. Um, and yes, I do, because it's just the, only because of the heat to cool down. Um, no, I don't. I'm I'm way old, way too old for it. I look at them, and it, it's children. It's great. And some of them are older, but, you know, for a 48-year-old man, it's, it'd be embarrassing. Thank you. Um, Justin, come on. <laughs> what do you think of the chance of your finance director winning gold in the breaststroke of Rio? <laughs> I know your breaststroke's better than your front crawl. That's for sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure if there's any more. I think we're obviously um, having some fun questions at the end. Look, thank you for, for coming on board, everybody, and for um, being involved in this. I, I do hope you're enjoying the games. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight's 800 free. But I think I think when we... I mean, this is a sort of, if you like, a sound bite from me with my head in the sport and trying to bring my head back out into the business world as well. Um, but as we go through the games, we're collecting more information, more ideas, and more reflections, and and really sort of honing them and thinking about okay, what what truly can we apply to business? So, gathering all the information. Um, I know there's a blog online as well that we've we, we have been writing, so you can get that through the website. So thanks for being there, and um, I'm off to have a little bit of a rest before I go commentate. Thank you. <laughs>